Uh, he's, he's somebody that I really respect a lot. I haven't had that time really like, you know, like, uh, uh, to talk to him in deeply, but uh, I truly feel that I have to do it if I want to increase or, uh, my, my business. So it's somebody that uh, I want to re uh, reach out more. So please uh, give it up for we Wisely Chan. <laughs> Am I on? Yeah. yeah. Wow, this thing is a lot clearer than our uh, previous mic. <laughs> now I can hear myself in HD. Yeah, that's cool. All right, how's, how's everyone doing? Great. You guys good? Man, yeah. you know, during during pregame, I it was it was kind of uh, unfortunate that Abigail had to keep checking you guys on your energy. That's something we really really got to work on, right? You know, it's it's kind of a, it's it's a crazy time in. I don't want to say society, but it's kind of a crazy time society with everything that's going on from coronavirus to, I mean, how many of you guys actually follow the markets, right? You guys have any clue what happened the last few days, yeah. right? I mean, look at, I don't know the exact number, but look at, on, on Thursday, I think it was probably like 29,900, close to 30,000, right? If you look at it today... It's like 26,000 something. 269? 20? 957, 269. Okay, whatever. 269. Right? Yes, Aaron? So, how do those points work? Well, let's just think about it. It's a change in, it's a change in percentage, right? So, it's about 9% loss, 8 to 8 to 9% loss over the course of the last three or four days. And at the same time, I think that directly resulted in a loss of about $1.6 trillion in the marketplace. Right, so in the last four days, U.S. economy—not the economy, sorry—the uh, U.S. people, people like your family and my family and your cousin and your coworker, your boss and his and his nephew, his niece, lost total of 1.4 trillion in 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 the Dow and the S&P, not including everywhere else. Right? I mean, this is it's uh, it's nothing compared to 2008. Right? But the rumblings are there, and you know, people think it's the whole it's coronavirus, and people are acting in fear. I mean, yeah, I'm sure that's part of it, but it's it's, it's a small part of what's happening. What's happening right now is supposed to happen. It's actually long overdue, right? It's actually way overdue. I mean, should have happened in 2016, just based on the numbers, right? Maybe 2017. We're already pushing 2020. And uh, we still have yet to hit a correction, and and market's been growing as, as big as it ever has, right? I mean, I, I, today is not the, the purpose of my conversation today is not to badger you with products and everything like that, but but to let you know our time is coming. Yeah. Think about it. Think about how many people are going to look at their 401k statements and be fearful as heck that they would just went from 200,000 down to 180,000 dollars in a few days, right? I mean, that's pretty much, that's like a 10% loss. It's pretty close to it. Think about it. Anybody that you know that has a 401k, if they're invested into the U.S. marketplace, they just lost nearly 10% of the portfolio in three days. Right? And, and, it's, and I think it, was, it went for even further down today. And we'll see, you know, with after I was trading and what, what happens tomorrow morning, see how much, see how deep this rabbit hole goes. Right? So... This is literally the perfect opportunity for you to be talking to everybody that you know about financial services. Is it the, is it the, uh, the most amazing topic that people want to talk about all the time? Probably not. Actually, definitely not. Okay? But at the same time, it's, it's probably one of the most important topics of discussion that needs to be had. And we have to stop being secret agents. We have to start being able to share with everybody that you know exactly what we do and having a little bit more urgency about it. Like Sophia just shared that story with you. And... You know, it was, it was a little surreal hearing about it the first time, but there's somebody in your marketplace that's probably going to go through the same thing tomorrow, the next time you talk to them, who knows, okay? And that's one of the great things about being in our company, in our industry, is the fact that we can actually enact positive change and make sure that we get to help these individuals, right? Um, man, and, and it's all about your marketing, and do the people around you know what you do, right? I'm going to get into some, some tangible stuff right now, but... 
but uh, I, I was going to share this story during pregame, but I figured out I was probably going to train today, so I saved it for here. So two days ago, well, let me just kind of backtrack. So I, I play tennis. You guys know. I talk about it all the time. I tell you guys to make sure you branch into your network of, of things that you like to do, because when you're happy doing the things that you do naturally, I think building rapport and making new friends is just really easy. Yeah. Right, like Anthony, if you're playing soccer with a group of people, regardless if you know them or not, you're going to build a rapport, and by the time you finish scoring that goal, you guys are like best friends at the end of the game, yeah. right? Yeah. Unless they're on the other team and you kick their ass, and then that's, no, that's a whole different way, right? And, and they, 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 if they hate you, like it's so funny because the group of guys that I play with, I've, I've improved since I started playing, right? And it's to the point where I need to find a different group because it's just boring for me now, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Like literally, it's just boring for me now. Like we're playing yesterday, and there's this guy named Ed. We're about to set a KTP with him. He's uh, he's a Peruvian dude. He just he's an optics engineer. He's one of three people in the U.S. that's authorized to do what he does. Uh, he does doesn't look like it the first time. I showed I showed somebody here a picture of it. He's like, oh, he looks like he's like a janitor or something. It's like, <laughs> no, it's def definitely not, right? I mean, he rolls up in a Bentley to play tennis. Like, I mean, it's he, he's he's real deal, right? Uh, but he, he was like talking to me, he's like, hey, he was telling this other guy, he's like, hey, you know what's the difference between uh, me and Wisely? I thought I was going to say, because he's a little bit older, I thought I was going to say something. He's like, he's like, he's way better than I am. And then he just starts laughing and walks away, right? But anyways, that's aside from the story. So I, I started, so there's a, a gentleman that I'm, I'm building a really good relationship with. He knows, you know, seems like he knows everybody. His best friend is a, is a very prominent judge in Orange County. And his wife is, leads the fellowship over at Saddleback Ranch in Irvine. I don't know if you guys have heard of that church. But it's basically like the, the uh, cottonwood of South Orange County. Right? It's a huge, super church. And, and people come from all over the place to go. Right? So he knows exactly what we do. I haven't done an appointment with him yet. He hasn't been out on the BPM. But, but, he, but you know, we've talked about our products and our services. He can't qualify for life insurance. He was in Aspen. No, not Aspen. In Switzerland somewhere. I forgot what they call it over there, like where their ski resorts, right? And yeah, it's like Al Alpines, or I, I forgot exactly. But he was skiing, had an accident, kind of rammed into a tree, broke his spine in four different areas, and uh, was pretty lucky to be alive, and still able to play tennis for some reason. It's like, it's incredible. He was paralyzed for like eight months. So anyway, so he's not qualifying for anything that we have to offer, right? Um, other than annuities and things like that. But he, uh, he has a friend named Dennis, that, uh, not my belly Dennis, for the few that <laughs> chuckled, right? Uh, but he, he was a banker. He's been a banker for the last 15 years, and he was laid off about two weeks ago because he didn't hit his quotas, wow. right? He didn't hit his quotas. Pretty crazy, pretty crazy. Uh, but, you know, he was smart, saved his money. He's kind of in a comfortable position. But James called me. He's like, hey, I have a guy named Dennis. He's been working in, the, in, in I think, similar to your industry, probably a little bit different from what you do. But uh, he's a banker. He got laid off. You, you think you have any use for him? Right? <laughs> he literally texted me, like, you think you have any use for him? I was like, yeah, absolutely. Send me his number. He's like, I'll do you one better. Lunch tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Nice. I was like, uh, okay, okay, 11 works, right? So we ended up having lunch on Tuesday. And built a really good relationship with him, and now I'm doing a kid to be with Dennis and his wife uh, next week. And, you know, they have two kids. They own a home. Um, his wife uh, used to be in sales, but now just stays home with the kids because he, makes, he made enough money at his job before. I was like, well, it's like, like how urgent are you? Like, uh, how, how important is it for you to get back into making money? He's like, it's kind of important, not so much. I actually have the opportunity to spend time with my kids now. Uh, I was like, okay, how much emergency fund are you sitting on? I was like, I, I just, I, I wanted to talk big, or I was like, you have at least two years? He's like, yeah, yeah, we have like 10 years, so we're good, right? So they saved their money, so, so I was like, okay, we're probably not too big on the business yet, but we'll get him as a, become a client because he's not health licensed or life licensed. He's just uh, 63 and 7 licensed, right? And that's all they did, just investments. And, and a lot of times, if, you t if, you, if somebody tells you, oh, you know, I have Merrill Lynch or Charles Schwab, Dean Witter, whatever the case is, whoever their big brand name uh, uh, financial company is, most, they don't do a deal in life insurance. Everything is mutual funds and fees and fees and fees because that's where they make their money. 
right? The security side. I was, I was having a conversation with Oak. I was consulting him about what I should do with my client. And, and he shared with me just like the fee structures of all these things. I mean, it's crazy how much fees there are when it goes into these, to these products. And a lot of times they don't understand it. They just think it's, uh, all right, it's here to here. Great. And that's it. But anyways, so do the people around you know enough about what you do so that they can give you referrals? And if they do not, that is not their problem. That is your problem, right? Imagine you own a restaurant, and no, none of your friends and family have been to your restaurant. What's great about Oak is he invites all of us to his restaurant, and then now we just start referring people. He actually gave me a hat, and it, the PMI hat, and some, like, people were asking me about it where I play tennis, and then I actually sent them, and they actually went to his restaurant, right? Because he tells everybody about it. The same way that everybody in his family also knows he's a financial advisor. Bless you. Right? But if we talk to some of your family members, whether they're positive or negative, that doesn't really matter. They can be negative about what you do and still know you're in finance. Right? So, but now it's up to you to, to prove them wrong so that they can now support you the same way that they support every, all the other ventures that you, know, you probably did in the past. Okay? So it's a, kind of a little thing that we got to work on. Um, is, is how you market yourself. Do people know what you do at every single level? Like it does, it does, they do not have to come to a BPM to know what you do, yeah. right? They shouldn't be able to have that just through conversation, okay? Uh, you know, is it important that you get them on a one-on-one -on -one and or a KTP immediately? Yes, it is important, okay? But you should be able, they should have a good understanding of um, what you do even before that, yeah. right? Like, there's some people that I've, that I've met that I told them, I was like, hey, you know, I want to set up a KTP with you. I don't use KTP, but, you know, just, just take it from the perspective that I'm giving it to, right? It's like, so there's a guy named Layton. I told him, like, hey, I want to set up time I can meet with you, show you what we do, um, that we can refer me to other people. He straight up was like, no, I trust you. I know what you do is good. Just, uh, you know, when somebody comes my way, I'll just send them to you. But about, about a month ago, he was involved in a biking accident. So he's been like completely out of it for the last, uh, for the last month. Like it's pretty bad. He, he was biking down Firestone right off the, by the Target in the 710. And there's a construction zone. It's like an actual bike, not like a motorcycle or anything, right? And uh, he was, it was just on the sidewalk. But then there was, a, there was no lights or anything, but there was a bar sticking out. And he's a tall guy, right? So he's riding on his bike, and he slams his face into the bar. He ended up breaking his nose. And um, like his C6 and C7 are herniated. So he's like going through all of that right now, right? Uh, yeah, he still probably still can, didn't break anything other than his nose. Uh, I don't think nose, I, I'm sure if you break your nose, you can still get LTC. There's no bones in here anyways, right? It's all cartilage. Um, it's okay, it's an excuse for a nose job. Uh, but anyways, right, right? Thai people, you guys would definitely know about that. <laughs> Just kidding. You got, oh, yeah, yeah, that happened to you, right? No. Okay, so uh, I've been eating a lot of Serranos every day, and I'm just, it's, just, it's just coming out now. It's coming out now, okay? So let's, I want to talk a little bit about adversity and dealing with it and then moving forward with, from it because, you know, I think that the lack of energy has a lot to do with maybe you're dealing with something in your life, right? Maybe you're dealing with uh, something within the business. Maybe you're, well, let me, let's just go from, go from this perspective, okay? So there's five major adversities that we can go through as people, all right? So the first one is a physical adversity. So maybe you're sick, you have the flu, you don't have coronavirus, you just have influenza, <laughs> right? Or you go through something a little bit more serious where it's you know, debilitating for the rest of your life. That could be a physical adversity, okay? It's, hey, it's part of life. It's what you go through. It is what it is, okay? So are you gonna let that define you or are you gonna move on from it? Are you the type of person that if you have a flu, you gotta stay at home all day and you can't get anything done and, and the whole world has to stop because you're sick? Or do you allow yourself to, to not make that excuse and continue to get things done? Right? There's, there's a slight difference between winning and losing, and it's that distinction right there, is how you respond with your adversities. There's people that go through a lot worse than, than some of the things that we have to go through, right? I mean, just from a, from a physical standpoint, okay? 
Right, the second one is a mental adversity. So this is the one that's a little bit more difficult to get out of because adversity is typically always in your head already. So when you have a mental adversity, your problem is in your head with your head. Right? This is the same, this is kind of why some of us, maybe it's, bless you, maybe it's really hard for you to fall asleep at night because you, you toss and turn all night thinking about what if, what could be, what could be, what could have been, and I should have done this, I should have done that, this should have, would have, could have. Right? And I didn't call out any names, and if people are laughing, you're just giving yourself away. Right? Um, but look at there's there's so many things that, that that why we talk about mental toughness and why it's so important is because of things like that, right? It's the mental adversities that you go through, and and regret is probably one of the biggest things, right? That's why we tell you, you know, from the second that you wake up, you should be doing everything you can to max out your day. That way, at the end of the night, you don't have anything to feel bad about. You gave it your best. It's usually when you don't give it your best and you sit on your butt and you do something and, and, you, and we all know what we should be doing, but we chose not to do it. That's what causes us to kind of, kind of toss and turn a little bit more. Okay. Third adversity is emotional. Our relationships. Do we let little things or do we, do we let our emotions control our day, rather? Because every single day when we wake up, we're not always going to be feeling 100%. Yeah, I'll be honest. Like, a lot of the times, I, I've, I've committed to going to the gym. I, I do go at least four or five times a week, every single week. I don't, that's, I don't miss out on, on the count. Okay, But I try to go in the morning. And a lot of times, I wake up in the morning, I don't feel so good. I was like, ah, it's fine. I'll just go at night instead. Right? That's, I, I still need to fight that a little bit, and I'm still working on it. We're not perfect. I'll still go in the morning at least you know, three out of the five times, maybe six times I go every single week. But other days, I wake up, it's like, oh, just, I'd rather just lay here for a little bit longer. All right? And I'm letting how I'm feeling, my emotional adversity that morning, define my actions for the rest of your day. Well, that's just with working out. Uh, what about in the business? I think most of you, if not all of you, would agree that when you're feeling better, you typically tend to do more, yeah. right? Like if you wake up and some, for some reason you're having a really good day, and that's good, right? You, you wake up, you immediately spring out of bed, you brush your teeth, get all your hygiene stuff done, and you're out of the house and you're productive, like right away. And then there's other days where you wake up and you just lay in bed for an extra 30 minutes, and then 30 minutes becomes 45 minutes for those of us that are full time. For those that are not, you just you have to get your job or you also get fired. So it's kind of you know it's good or bad, um, good and bad. Uh, so you don't have that luxury of kind of lounging around, okay? But for those of us that do, when do you actually get your day started if you're not feeling well, right? So that's an emotional adversity that you got to go through, okay? Fourth one is social. This is the one about relationships. Look, I don't care who your best friends are. Eventually, you're, there's going to be a disagreement. Okay? You know, Eric and I are as close as can be, but do we agree on 100% of things? Hell no. Not even close. Right? Maybe, like, I, th I would say we're very agreeable at least at 85 to 90% of the things. Okay? But we do have our disputes. We do have our arguments. I'm sure you've had an argument with your upline. Right? For those of us that brothers and sisters, I'm sure you've definitely had arguments with your brothers and sisters. Right? I'm an only child, so I just argue with myself. Right? <laughs> so, but for the rest of us, do you have siblings and you're close with your parents? Like, especially parents. Right? I'm sure through your teenage years, you, you had, you know, we've had our phase where we know everything and then we become dumb again. Right? Like, we argue with our parents about things. Okay? So that's a social adversity. Now, just because you have an argument with somebody, does that mean you just drop the relationship completely and it's gone and never again, you're never going to talk to them again? No. Right? I mean, third grade, yes, but not, not anymore, right? Okay? So, what is the thing? Uh, especially in our business, because we are so big on where people business, you have to realize that social adversities are going to happen every single day. I would say literally every single day, if you're doing the work, and you got to be able to move past it. Yeah. Okay, uh, people are going to flake on you. 
If you expect 100% of the people that say yes to you to show up, you're in for a, for a rough ride, <laughs> right? If you expect, if, hey, you're going to pick up when I call you, right? Yeah. You're a man of your word? Yeah, 100%. And then they, they block you, and then you never talk to them again, okay? That's part of the business. It's part of the process. And there's nothing you can do about it, okay? Now, the last adversity is uh, financial. Right? And, and I don't know if everybody in here has gone through some type of financial adversity, but it sucks just as much as the rest of them. But I think out of all of them, it's the easiest one to fix. Right? Between physical, emotional, uh, mental, and social, financial is the easiest one to fix. Spend less than what you make, and then you won't have a financial problem. Just like that. Right? I mean, the U.S. system has made it so easy to fix your financial problem that bankruptcy is an option, yeah. right? I have all this debt, and I screwed it up. Let me just, all right, file bankruptcy. I'm forgiven of all my debt, and let me just start over. Now I just can't borrow money from anybody because nobody will loan it to me unless I go to a loan shark, okay? But other than that, but you get an opportunity to start over, right? So financial is literally the easiest one to fix, especially if you're in our company. Right? If, you, if, you know, if you're still part-time, great, stay part-time. When you're ready financially, you know, you got a year's worth of emergency fund, then you can consider coming full-time. Or six months, or you, know, you got a team brewing, you got some momentum in your side, then you can, you can, you can consider coming full-time into the business. Uh, because, man, I, I saw this uh, post on Michael Chernyowski. Anybody know who that is? Right, well, I, I, yeah. So... I saw this last night, so, yeah, was it last night? I think it was last night. The, the, it was last night when I sent the, the chat, into the chat, right? The big cycle. Look at this cycle. Read it out loud. Read it out loud. Eight hundred and thirty-seven grand on yesterday's cycle. Eight hundred, not eight, not eight hundred thirty-seven dollars. Eight hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars on yesterday's cycle. Yeah, but that's not even the most exciting part. Yeah, Sophia and Abby are talking about it right now, right? So the most exciting part is up to this month to date, not year to date, month to date, that team has over a thousand recruits. Thousand recruits. And you know, like you know how like we've seen like the million dollar cycles before? That's from a bonus, right? When you hit FC, when not FC, EC, like when Andy Wynn and Jeff Levitan hit executive chairman, they get a million dollar bonus from the company. That's where their million dollar bonuses came from. It's, it's not that it means any less. A million dollars is a million dollars, okay? But this is not a executive bonus check. This is just a cycle. My goodness, right? Imagine making $800,000 a month, okay? That's $10 million a year, just about, right? This is 800,000 a cycle. And he's in Hawaii right now. And he's in Hawaii right now, right? With 50 qualifiers, or just about. I mean, it's awesome. And we are not missing any more Hawaii trips. We're qualifying this year, for sure. I know Evolution's going to qualify this year, for sure, too. And the rest of you guys that are still in the base shop, I expect you to not be in the base shop. And let's all get our asses over to Hawaii. Yes. Right? Because that's, that's, that's where the real party is right now. Like we're going to celebrate Miami when we all qualify in, in May. Um, and, then, and then when we get back from Miami, then the real work begins, right? Because qualify, qualifying for uh, Hawaii starts in June, okay? But, I mean, think about that for a second. An $837,000 cycle. Just, just, just for a minute, right, in your mind, think about what you would do at eight hundred grand. Yeah. Right? Just, just for a second. What would your life look like? Like yeah, I mean obviously you'd save it. Where I don't I don't know 
anybody in the financial services industry that is so reckless that I could figure out how to spend $800,000, right? <laughs> I mean, that's true, but, but like imagine making enough money that you could be like super reckless and you still wouldn't be able to spend all of it. Right? I mean, think about that, okay? A, a Lamborghini is what? Call it 200 grand, okay? You could buy 200, you could, for $200,000 over the course of 52 weeks, that's $10 million a year if you bought a Lamborghini a week. If you make $800,000 a month, you make $10 million, you could literally buy a Lamborghini a week and you would still have money. I mean, I don't know anybody that needs 52 Lamborghinis. But you could do it. Right? I mean, for those, yeah, it's just buy the dealership, exactly. You know, like, imagine you're in a position where you, I mean, for those of us that love to eat out and, like, do, like, eat nice things, and you go to, like, a Mastro's or whatever, Mastro's is whatever now, but, uh, you know, a $300 meal, let's say, let's just do some math, right? $300 a meal times 30 meals in a month, like, every night you go, okay? That's what, 10 grand? That's $120,000 a year that you spend on food. And that is, if you make 10 million, that's 1% of your income. Like, at that point, you're like, who cares? Let's go eat for lunch and dinner. <laughs> right? Imagine, imagine that being your lifestyle. Not that you would want to eat at Mastro's every single day or wherever, okay? You're in a life where you can do whatever you want and you would still have limitless resources. That's what, that's what the business can do for you. Right, and obviously we learn about money. So out of that eight hundred grand, you're probably putting seven hundred thousand into investments, and then hundred grand in the bank, or whatever, wherever else you want to put it. Right? I mean, think about that. Okay, you could buy a house, a very nice house in Southern California with that cycle. Forget about the annual income. Right? I mean, that just trips me out. Like we see a hundred thousand dollar cycles all the time. I'm almost desensitized to it. Right? I don't know if you guys follow Greg Cap. Yeah. Like every other week, he's posting, oh, $100,000, $95,000, $200,000 cycle. It's like, oh, whatever. He made $200,000 yesterday. It's not a big deal. Right? And then you see an $800,000 cycle, and then you're like, holy shit. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, that's, that's real. Okay. So, but look, that only happened because they went through all the adversities and continue to survive. I, I, I don't personally know Eric Olson at all. Like I've said hi to him a few times, and my first year in the business, our hierarchy and his hierarchy were partnered, so I got a chance to kind of talk with him a little bit. Um, and at that point, he wasn't even at a million in cash flow yet. I mean, perspective, right? I mean, he was making almost 800000 a year at that point. Now he made that yesterday. Um, but uh, And that's only been eight years, right? I mean, take your life at eight years, and you... Put eight hundred thousand dollars cycle into your life, okay? If you knew that was your future, do you think it'd be worth working hard for? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You, you think it might be giving? It might be worth giving some energy at the BPMs? Yes. Yeah. So, so these are little little things, right? Um. Anyways, so so I don't know him all that well and and whatnot, but what we do know is a lot of the stories that we've been able to hear from him and Paul Hart and Bayona and Juan Jaime when they were first starting the business, right? You know, so they, so one, one thing that I know, right, they, so him, Paul Hart, they had one upline. They signed a lease to a big-ass office, all the three of them together, right? It was a $10,000 a month lease. And then less, he, as a senior associate, when Eric Olson was still a senior associate, his upline, his SMD, quit. So now it's the two of them as senior associates. He was a senior, Olson was a senior associate, Paul Hart was uh, an associate, and now they have uh, a $10,000 a month lease on their head. And that was upline and downline. Yeah, <laughs> that was upline and downline. So imagine we got one of you guys to put your name on the lease here, and then we go, peace out, we're out. Not for a single office, but for the entire office. Right? You think that might be some financial adversity? <laughs> Right? Just, just a little bit. Right? I mean, hey, why do, why do you think he went out and made 
quarter million dollars his first year. Right? He had to. He had to. You know what's crazy about that? Half of that went to office rent. Do you guys realize how much money goes into this office every single year? Yeah, you do. All right? Like, like he, he you know, sees the checks being sent out every month. And then the, the, what it costs will be paid to clean the place. And then the TV outside, like the little things. I mean, sometimes, the, like, obviously, we collectively pay for the office. But I would say, on average, every single year, like, as far as an investment into the office, I would say $175,000 gets put into this office every year. Right? At least. Yeah. At least. Office rent alone is about 135 And then we complain about a $50 plug-in. Right? Compare your financial adversity to to Jim Melita's financial adversity, and you'll know exactly why he makes the money that he does and you make the money that you do. Right? I mean, it's the truth. You gotta, you gotta, it takes money to make money. And you have no pressure on yourself, and you have no, no reason for you to get out of bed every single morning and bust it. I mean, obviously, you have your kids, and the, those are things, too, uh, that we, we you can utilize, and people that we can utilize as, as, a, as a reason, as a purpose. Okay? But there's no pressure, because everything is already good without the business. Right? Anyways. Okay, so those are the five adversities, okay? So let's talk about what we can do to deal with them and uh, in a positive, constructive way. All right. So, so dealing with adversity, right? How do we write the, how do we write the mentality, the mind with the right mentality? Okay, so the first one is actually pretty, number one is pretty simple. Bless Thank you. you. Thank you. It's just accept that it's part of the process. Just accept that it's part of the process. I know it's probably like, well, duh, right? But some of us, some of us, so so many of us, we haven't accepted it that it's accepted that it's part of the process because I still hear you complain about it, right? So the second you complain about something, it means that you haven't bought in. Things like, oh, it's too hard. My guest hasn't doesn't show up. Uh, you know, people are not picking up my phone calls. Yada yada yada. Look, that happens to everybody. I don't care what level you are. I, there, if, you, if you go on YouTube, and there's this uh, training with Jeff Blavitan. I don't know if it's still there. But I remember watching it. And he was talking about how when he was broke in the business, he would recruit people. And the objections that they would give him is, hey, you know what? You haven't made any money. How can I trust that you're, uh, you know, this is a legit business? So, so that's an objection that maybe some of you guys get, right? It's like, I'll join you when you're rich, right? And then now, he, he, and he goes from the perspective of where he's at now, you know, million dollar earner, he goes, now you know what, you know what, he goes, now what, you know what the challenge I get is every person that sits in front of me goes, oh, you make all this money in the world, you can't understand me, so I'm still not gonna join your business. <laughs> right? So it happens to everybody at every single level. Like, like Jim Melita, like I'm just gonna use Eric as an example, because you know, he's on my upline and I know him best, right? Okay. He, he operates, and he'll admit this to you, he operates in a weird space where people either really, really like him or they really, really dislike him. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's not a lot of people that are in between. They're like, eh, he's, he's cool, I guess. Like, you're not going to hear anybody say that about Eric. It's like, you, you really like him or you really don't. Okay? So when he recruits people and, 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 and when a brand new person meets him, okay, it's, uh, they either really like what he stands for or they're intimidated and they become haters. It's part of the process, right? So whatever you're going through right now, know that you're supposed to go through it. If it sucks, good. Let it suck. And then realize that you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna win anyway, right? For those of us that have been here a few years and you still, don't have a lot, you still don't have a lot of people on your team, that's all right. You're making all the mistakes now, so when the big team comes, you'll be ready for it. Or maybe you've had a big team, and then... They're gone. They weren't right for the business. Look, there's an accordion, right? All you Mexicans know that for sure, <laughs> right? Okay, that applies. That applies to the business. Your business is going to grow, and then it's going to shrink, right? We hear Ger uh, Guillermo comes. Guillermo. <laughs> I couldn't decide if I want to say G or Guillermo, so Guillermo, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. 
I'm being recorded down. Um, but anyways, so, so I, I'll never forget my first year in the business when we were still sharing an office with him. He constantly talked about that because we were on a rise. Because like, we, were, we were just growing so much to the point where we thought we were invincible. I mean, that's, that's awesome. And we got, we, we, you know, even in Lakewood at one point when we were in our CEO run, that's how this hierarchy felt, yeah. right? Well, that was, this is how the last BPM we had on Saturday felt, right? I mean, compare last Saturday's vibe to today's vibe, yeah. right? What was the difference? It's, I mean, the people, it's, we're, all of you guys were here Saturday, or yeah. most of you guys were here Saturday, okay? Well, how can we even bring the same type of intensity? Right? We'll get to that. But anyways, I remember him talking about this accordion, and I remember sitting in the crowd thinking, like, why the heck are you being so negative? Right? It's like, why are you telling us that it's going to shrink? Uh, but man, he was right, because he was trying to prepare us for when it does, because it inevitably will. Nothing rises forever. Nothing stays falling forever. Right? So anyways, accept that it's going to happen, and it's part of the process. And your path might be different from other people, right? Like there's a, there's a couple in Maryland named Daniel and Mary Fombo. They're three years in the business at three quarters of a million dollars already, right? And then they're upline Levi. They're at 700,000 now, basically just riding that wave, right? Every time Daniel hits a ring, they hit a ring. Mm -hmm. Like it's pretty cool. Like at the same time, like you just one message and then you get another message. Like you go on Eric Olson's, uh, Instagram right now, you see Daniel, and then like two posts later, you see them get their ring, right? I mean, I don't, I don't care how I get my ring as long as I have the business that gets, it gets me to it, right? Like, I mean, seriously. Uh, it, it, for me, it's about the life that I get to live, not necessarily who gets the credit. I don't know if you guys feel the same about that or how you feel. Like, I know Eric's very driven by the, by the recognition, and that's awesome, and like, that's the type of personality he is, and that's why he continues to win, and has all the MVPs, and like, all that, right? But look, if I'm making a million dollars, whether it's for my personal pen, or if I get just overrided, and, and somebody on my team is making five million, but I still get to make my one million, I'm good, yeah. right? You still live your dream life, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, like this 800,000 that Olsen made, how much of that do you think went to Rob Day? Like, I mean, come on, okay? I mean, it's, it's badass. Um, but anyways, it's, it's during the accordion when it's coming back down is the, the diversity that's supposed to happen and, and, and you've got to respond accordingly, okay? All right, number two. So ask yourself, what will this teach me? So embrace all your adversities as an opportunity to learn. Maybe you've heard that a million times already. Okay, but if you still haven't picked up on it, it just means you haven't learned. Okay, so let's just talk in, in terms of the business, right? And then I'll, I'll, I'll connect it to something outside of the business and just make it really easy to understand altogether. Okay, so if I am prospecting, right, everybody in here should at least have an idea of what it's like to prospect somebody. Maybe you don't do it every day, but I'm sure you've at least done it uh, once or twice. Okay, so if I keep, if let's say I talk to 100 people a day and 100 people say no to me, all right, and I'm using the number 100 because it's just easier for my percentages, okay? I don't know if anybody in here has ever talked to 100 people in a day, right? Anybody ever talked to 100 people in a day? I know I have, and I think like we've peaked out like 50s, right? But uh, I'm sure Sophia's gotten close. She's gotten 40 numbers in a day before, right? But uh, anyways, so let's say I talk to 100 people in a day, and 100% 100 100 of them say no to me, OK? Do you think that's my fault or the 100 people's fault? No. Chances are it's probably me, right? I mean, out of 100 people, let's just say you're halfway decent, right? Halfway decent. What percentage of people do you think of numbers decent you should get? 15? 50%. 50%. Okay, I was thinking more like 40%. Close enough, let's say 40% of people will say yes to you, okay? But see, now, um, we'll, a lot of us will never get to that number because we don't talk to 100 people. But for argument's sake, let's just say 40, okay? Maybe, and then, but I never talked to anybody about it and I'm stuck at 40%, 40%, 40%. If you were to get 40 new numbers, let's just say in a week, right? It's still, it's pretty solid. Okay, 
But what if you were able to transition that 40 to 80 percent? So for that every 100 people that you talk to, you were able to get 80 numbers, all right? Look, why is it that some people, they can talk to 10 people and get 10 numbers, and there's other people that can talk to 10 people and get zero, all right? It's what they say and how they say it. So are you learning from the mistakes that you're making when you're talking to somebody? Like, I'll, I'll tell you, like, <laughs> prospecting for me has got, it's got to be like my, my biggest Achilles heel, from the in, especially from the beginning. I had a day, and I'll never forget, because I sat at the In-N-Out in Alhambra, just like super upset. I ordered myself three double-doubles, and uh, yeah, and I called Eric, and I was like, I talked to 28 people today, and nobody said yes to me. What the hell? This doesn't work. Like, I was just so upset, right? And I just, I just, I just I'll never forget. Right? It's the In-N-Out on Huntington Drive and Garfield Avenue. I spent like all day out there talking to 28 people. Imagine getting rejected 28 times. Okay? Some of you guys don't get rejected 28 times a week, right? Or months. You guys talk to so few people. Anyways, so, um, and then he started asking me, he's like, hey, you know, when you're approaching these people, what does your face look like? Are you smiling? Are you not? Uh, what's your opening line? Like, what, what, how, do you, how are you breaking the ice? Right? So I'm talking to all these people, but I'm making all the same damn mistakes and not learning from them, therefore causing myself more pain. Okay? So, so for a lot of us in here, when you're making your calls, how do you sound when you're making your calls? I feel like a lot of times I'm like, hey, bro, like, you got to sound a little bit more excited. Yeah. Right? That's just like, that was like the, you're putting me to sleep. I'm sitting in front of you. <laughs> right? You got to have a little bit more excited, excitement. How are you handling these objections? When people give you a response, do you take forever to respond because you're not well practiced? Or do you, are you right on top of your shit and right away you know exactly what to say and how to respond and how to provide the objection? All right? Look, we have 30 people in the room and we have, I don't know, let's say 15 pieces of business, whatever that number is. Okay? Why? Why? Can, can, you, can you earn commissions here without helping a family out? For, for, at least from an insurance or a retirement perspective? No, you cannot, right? You can go recruit all the people in the world, but until you actually put together a policy, you're not making any money, okay? I thought the goal here was to be able to make money and provide for your family. The goal is to eventually get an $800,000 cycle, okay? But that can't happen unless we well, get in the field and you go help some families. Yeah. Or even if you personally didn't go in the field, let me rephrase, even if you weren't the trainer on these appointments, you should still be going on the field as a trainee so eventually you can learn how to be a trainer, right? You know how I learned how to be a trainer? We had so many appointments that Eric was like, I can't do it, you do it. It's like, what? You want me to do the KTP? And mind you, I'm 19 years old at this time, okay? Like, like think about it right now. If a 19-year-old showed up to you at your current age, at your house, right, with a faux hawk, uh, with a sh uh, the suit that doesn't fit, like, it, it was really funny. So my shirts and my suits were, like, kind of fitted, right? And then I had really, really, like, like they're not skinny jean tight, but they're, like, tight slacks, right? I showed up to your house. Do you think you think you'd buy from me? Right? Like, I think back, I think back, I'm like, holy hell, there's no way I would have bought from me. Like, it's so funny. Like, I, I, we meet salespeople now, and it's like, man, like, you're in your 30s and 40s, and they still don't want to buy from you. Like, how the hell does someone feel buy from me when I was 19, when I was 20? I got my ring as a 21-year-old. Right? Like, I don't, I just, I don't see, at least me, like, I, if I show you some older pictures of me when I was 19, like, I look like I was 13. Like when I was 21, I looked like I was like 15. Okay, like a lot of the times I would get in the field, they're like, "Are you like how are you even old enough to do this?" Okay, I mean seriously, think about that for a second. Okay, but look, I learned from every single mistake that I made, and I got better. And I'm not old by financial services industry standards, right? Like none of you guys are old by financial services. None of us are. My right? financial services industry old is like you're like 67. Right? Young in the financial services industry is still like 40s. Seriously. You don't see a Charles Schwab advisor in his 20s. You don't. You don't see a Merrill Lynch, at least a senior you know, type of advisor in their 20s and 30s. 
Now they're all in their 40s, 50s, 60s. We say it in our slides all the time, right? A third of our, more than a third of the uh, agents are above 55. Now that's typically, you think of, what do you, when you think of financial services? Okay, sorry? An old white guy with glasses. Like literally, that's, all I, that's what I think about. Right, I think of Ben Franklin, because of, uh, <laughs> right? Like Templeton Investments. Don't you see those like commercials? Yeah. And then his face pops up. Yeah, yeah but, but Fish needs about 30 years of age. <laughs> you're, like, you're like 25? Yeah. 25? Yeah, so like, he needs like 30, 35 years of age to fit into the industry. Right? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Anyways, right? See? Emotional adversity, social adversity, right there. He has to learn to deal with it. Okay? All right. But look, so, so that's applied to the business, but there's so many other things that you can apply to all other areas of your life. Right? Like, I, I know, like, the whole hierarchy is kind of on uh, this whole going to the gym high, right? Like, and it seems like everybody's at the gym these days. Right, like there's a picture of it, and if you're not at the gym, you're recording yourself outside walking and running, and, and like it's just like everybody's at the gym now, okay? But you realize if you don't eat right, along with going to the gym, nothing is going to happen, yeah. right? I mean, you you'll, you'll get some muscles, right? You'll 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 maybe you'll look a little buffer, but you're not gonna get any healthier. Like remember, the goal is to be healthy, yes. right? And then aesthetics comes second. Oak, right? <laughs> Oak. <laughs> no, it's because of a conversation we had yesterday. <laughs> Last night. <laughs> um, anyways, so the goal is to be healthy, right? So you might think, like, oh, why am I not losing weight? Why am I not doing this? Well, you might be working out, but you're doing everything else wrong. Yeah, yeah. So you've got to learn from those mistakes, yeah. right? Anyways, you get what I'm saying? Yes. 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 Okay? Like any area of your life that you feel like you're not having the results that you want to have, well, analyze it and realize what mistakes you're you're making, and then learn from it. And if you can't figure out what mistakes you're looking, you're making, or, or and or looking for, go to your upline. All right, your upline is operating from a higher altitude. Eric can see a lot of things, business and life perspective-wise, that I know I cannot see yet. All right, like there's like little things that he's pointed out in our business and, in, and actually in our personal lives that never in a million years I would have thought of, but the second we changed, it got better. Yeah. And it was just, all we had to do was ask. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's incredible. Like, like, sometimes it feels like he's a fortune teller, but when we go to lunch, if, for those of you guys who have ever had a lunch with Eric, okay, the second you sit down, you build rapport for about five minutes, after you, after you order your food, all of a sudden it's right, immediately business. Yeah. Immediately business, the second food ordering is done, boom. They're like, whoa, that was a crazy switch. And then you're, like, literally, it's like an on and off switch. Yeah. Like, for those of you that have, have literally been to lunch, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? And then eating, like, he's like, eating and coaching at the same time, and, and then by the time he's done eating, your plate's still full because you're just, like, yeah. listening, yeah. right? Uh, I mean, it's incredible. But it's like he's a fortune teller because he's picking out everything that you're feeling, you're not doing, and or doing all at the same time. Why? It's not because he can actually read your minds. He's been there before himself. And he's helped a lot of people get out of it. A lot of people get out of it, right? OK, number three, reinvent yourself. And the easiest way to, like I'm sure you guys have heard that all the time, right? You got to reinvent yourself. Can anybody like describe to me what that means? Oh shit, that was probably amplified through the mic, huh? <laughs> right? So when you got when re, re, reinvent yourself, what does that mean? Somebody want to share that with me? Aaron? Go ahead. Uh, you can, for example, take your wardrobe. Uh, I know for me, I didn't have the best wardrobe. White, white shoes. I remember those. <laughs> did, you set, did you end up setting them on fire like we told you to? Uh, I, I don't even know where those things are. Oh, good. Yeah. good. That's, a, that's a service to the world. Yeah, so Okay, so, so that's, that's part of it. So upping your wardrobe is a way to reinvent yourself. Okay, what else? Hello? Uh, changing your habits, doing things 
Okay. And so, so that's one of the one of the things that, that I felt very uncomfortable doing in the past. Right. And I have to do it every day. Yeah. Sophia can relate with you. Right. Anybody else want to give a shot? Danny? It also has to do with your circle of friends or the people around you. I think uh, it's probably part oh, of yeah. this. Is, uh, getting, if you have negative people or like, you're people who constantly tear down whatever exciting you might bring, getting out of that it would be part of reinventing yourself. Yeah, that's huge. Right? I mean, as humans, we, we have homeostasis, right? It's a very fancy word of saying that our body likes to stay the same. We like to regulate, right? So if you spend time with 10 negative people, your body naturally wants to, what, lower the temperature to their level so you become a negative person. You spend time with 10 people that are on fire, right? Your body wants to regulate and move towards the fire, okay? But not quite the exact answer I'm looking for. Let's do one more. All right, good. Carlos? OK, so changing the habits once again. OK, good. All right, so do you guys understand the difference between a goal and a plan? Yes. yes. Right, somebody, how about somebody define that for me? All right, Steph? Um, for the goal, it's, what is this? Is that a goal? Or um, you know when they, um, when they assassinated uh, Mohammed? Yeah. They said the goal was always to get to him. but. Um, they had different plans on how to attack just in case something would have happened. So the plans can change, but the goal doesn't. Great. Like right. That was literally the example I was going to use, right? So that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. All right. Whoosh. Okay. Yeah, I know. You just now, now you stole five minutes of my training time. Right? Like, now I need to come up with like five more minutes, right? I'm just kidding. Okay. But I don't know if all of you guys know that story. It's, it's, it's really important, okay? So, so the difference between a goal and a plan is goals are concrete, okay? And plans can be changed, right? So reinventing yourself is changing your plan of attack, right? So all, everything that was mentioned from the habits, your daily habits, right, to you know, so changing the people that you uh, spend time with, okay? That's literally changing your plan of attack. So um, to, to just kind of further talk a little bit more about, like Stephanie, they helped with, she brought up the Bin Laden. So they trained for months on how they're going to take down Bin Laden, right? But so the, here comes the day of, and within minutes of starting the mission, one of the two helicopters goes down, right? I mean, talk about throwing a, you know, everything goes to, to crap, right? Like literally within the first few minutes, helicopter goes down, it, was, it happened so fast and there was no communication. And Robert O'Neill, he's the guy that talks about this, he gets off of his helicopter and he walks by the down helicopter and he was thinking back in his mind, he's like, man, these, these guys are catching up to our technology. That, that looks exactly like our helicopter, right? But he didn't know it was their helicopter because it went down that quickly, right? And then they went in, they got the man and, and you know, the rest is history and we know all about this, right? In May, whatever year it was, okay? So the goal didn't change. The plans did, okay? So how does this apply to a lot of things that you're doing in your life? Like I'm sure maybe one out of every 10 things that you're doing right now is going exactly to plan and exactly how you wrote it down on your business plan. Maybe even less, maybe even less, right? I think we, we have every, all, you know, December 31st of last year, we all put together a business plan we suggest that you write 10 personal, 10 financial, 10 business goals, right? Okay. If, would you say maybe three out of those 30 are actually going to plan? And if the answer is no, then I mean, that's, I'm not surprised because it's not supposed to, right? You're eventually supposed to be able to cross off all of those goals, okay? But it almost never happens the way you expect it to, right? So you got to constantly find new ways to win. <coughs> Look, one of the things that this hierarchy has constantly been able to do is find new ways to reinvent itself in, in times of need, right? So uh, let's just go through all the years, right? So in 2012, uh, Eric had three people on his team. Team Genesis was three, 
right? Just here, and that was it. Okay. And then I was recruited, and then we, and then Eric got to his ring, and then we hit quarter million dollar, and we hit EMD within the next uh, 12 to 13 months, uh, 12 to 18 months. Can't remember exactly when. Okay. Um, he hit his ring in October of 2012, and then he qualified for Hawaii the first time, and then he got his quarter million almost exactly a year later. Okay. So reinventing Eric's business in 2012 was when I was recruited, and then we got Abigail, Sophia, Jeff, and and all the other people that kind of blew up from that lake, okay? The following year, we had tapered off a little bit, right? So we recruited a guy named Brandon Clores, who recruited a guy named Howard, and then who recruited a guy named Chester, who recruited a lady named Vicky, who then recruited a guy named Daniel Corona. In that leg, there's two SMDs, one that you know and one that you don't, right? So 2013 was like the Daniel Corona year and, and Howard Shin year, right? 2014, we recruited uh, Randy from Darren's leg, which was, did my Yuri recruit Darren? Yes. Or, right? Yeah. Okay, so we recruited a, guy, a lady named my Yuri, who recruited a guy named Darren, who messaged a random guy on Facebook and it turned into Randy Wong. And Randy Wong became an SMD with a ring, who recruited another person that became an SMD. I mean, isn't that crazy? Yeah. Just like little things like that, just phew, yeah. weird. Okay, so that's 2014. And then 2015 comes along. Who did we recruit in 2015? Angela Umel. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and Juan. Okay? Uh, I, I mean, from like Eric's like, perspective, like as far as like SMDs like, that are going to be in his base shop and super base. Right? Um, so, and then 2015 we recruited, uh, recruited uh, Angela. Right? And then uh, 2016, I think you guys came into the fray. In October, right? And then 2017, 18, not as much activity in 17, but 18, who came into the picture? End of 18? Monica, right? And the miracle came in January of 2019. So every single year, basically every 12 to 18 months, there was a new hero in the hierarchy. We're waiting for the next one. Could be one of you. Right? Like what I didn't mention, like in 2014 when Randy was taken off, so were they. Abigail and David. They were the big producers that year too. Right? So every single, huh? Yeah, I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> Look at Randy's purpose in the business was to piss Abigail off, yeah. and then there we go. Right? Like some people, that's what, that's what their purpose is. Right? So, so go recruit somebody. Yeah, literally, every day. We, we would get it. It, like it, was, it was fun to watch. It was fun to watch, right? Like Corona was part of the mix too, and they'd all beef, and, and, and you should have seen the SMD chats those days. It was a lot of fun. Um, or I guess it was MD's, MD chat. Uh, but anyways, every single year there was a different hero in the sense that this hierarchy had to reinvent itself to get to the same goal, right? The goal was, was the first was 100,000, and then it was 250, and then it was EMD. Remember what it was like on the CEO run for those of you guys that were here? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Look, like everything about the hierarchy was different because everybody's plans were different. Okay? So, so how, do you, how, do we, how can we expect to get back to that same fire and same, same you know, intensity and focus if we don't start making plans to change now? Like, think about it. Like I want you to, to like be honest. You don't have to say it out loud or like honest or like you know like tell everybody. But when's the last time you actually sat down and put together a plan for your business on what you're gonna do tomorrow and then what you're gonna do this month and what you're gonna do? When's the last time you went down your pipeline? When's the last time you met with your upline and kind of consulted with them on exactly what you're gonna do to get your next promotion, your next goal? <coughs> right? All these things we have to qualify for. Do you have a plan in place that's gonna help you get there? If the answer is no, I mean, well, no wonder we're lost. Look, we need to reunite and really get focused together because we have a lot to accomplish in 2020, right? As, as much as, as uh, we've already done, this is a very important year for us. And the reason before that is next year, it's kind of a coin flip where Eric's going to be. As a matter of fact, if you're sitting in this room, it's kind of a coin flip where you're going to be. Right? To, to, a, to, to a 
kind of to an extent, we have no idea where anybody's going to be this time next year. Do you guys realize that? Yes. Right? Like Irvine is in the works, but it's not solidified. Walnut's going and blowing. Florida's going and blowing. San Francisco is about to be set up. We don't know if we're going to stay in Lakewood. I mean, this is, there's like a 0.1% chance that we stay in this office. It's like, no way we're staying in here. Okay? They want to jack up the rent to like double what we're paying now. I mean, we're already paying enough rent as it is. Right? Man, we pay like $12,000 $12, a month for this place. Or just about. Just under $12,000 a month for this place. Think about that. Crazy. And they want to make that like 19000 or something. Okay? We pay way more than enough for space like this. Right? Nothing wrong with it. It's a beautiful spot. But I think for twenty grand a month, we can do better. Right? So, so this is a really important year for us. Right? Where are you going to be next year? Look. Why is WFG so great is because we don't have to ask ourselves these questions every single day in the sense that if there's no office, there's so many offices that we can go find and we just put together. And the leaders of this hierarchy are in a position where they can just go open up whenever they want to, or wherever they want to. Now the question is, you know, how big of a role are you going to have? Because for all we know, I'm not saying this can happen, but for all we know, Eric could move to Florida next year. So for those of us that are here, that are in his base shot, or still are really reliant on him, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Right? I group ourselves into that category. We're very reliant on Eric. We require his coaching. We want his coaching. OK, what are we going to do? Better grow. It's a perfect time to do so now. Right? So this time next year, we're probably going to be in separate offices. And that's a good thing. Expansion is a great thing. Yeah. It's great for the Genesis brand. It's great for the community. Man, like, if we had one central hub versus you know, six different hubs that, that we can actually branch out and help other people, that's ideal. That's how we are going to be able to reach out to more people. That's why the US Army isn't all just based in DC. And that's it. Imagine every single soldier that was in existence in one place. <laughs> that just would not be very smart. Strategically, like just not be a good idea. Okay? Well, hey, we're kind of like soldiers too. We're fighting fi you know, financial illiteracy. And we've got to be able to you know, expand our reach as much as we can. So this is our year that we prep for that. All right? When we go into a new office next year, do you want 10 soldiers fighting with you or no soldiers fighting with you? Do you want 50 people? Do you want 100 people? I mean, maybe I'm talking too big. Who knows? I'm too small. Who knows, this time next year we could have 500 people. Yep. It really can happen that quickly. We've seen it happen. Literally, from one year to the next, you can go from you know, 30 people to 300 people. If you do the math, it's really not that hard. All right? If 30 people, you should get three directs a month for a whole year. Right? That's 1,000 recruits. And so if all of us here go get three directs for the rest of the year, it's 1,000 recruits, 1080, to be exact. All it requires is that we put together a plan to get things done. That make sense? Yes. yes. OK. All right, number four. <laughs> I just got a text message from Ray. And he goes, I've been there, bro. I ordered three double doubles one time when I was feeling down. <laughs> I, I appreciate you, Ray. <laughs> yeah? That's awesome. I love it. I love it. That's so cool. Uh, all right. I don't even remember what I was talking about now. OK. <laughs> All right. So number four is uh, it's kind of all-encompassing. I've been talking about it the whole time, right? But it's understand why the adversity happened in the first place. OK. We have so many great examples to follow that we can literally decipher exactly why something happened. It's not like medicine. I watch a lot of, I used to watch House all the time, right? 
Like it's just sometimes just unexplainable. You have no idea why it happened, how it happened, it just happened, okay? But in our business, in finance, it's very easy for us, I don't know if easy is the right word, but it's simple enough for us to understand why. Like there's, there's a cause and effect to everything in our business, right? Like we complain about chargebacks from time to time, okay? Well, why are these chargebacks happening? Jay Gauthier said it here one time. He's like, uh, he was talking about people that are in chargeback mode. He's like, I don't understand that. Why, why would you need to be in chargeback mode if you were doing what was right for the client to begin with? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you, you got to understand why you get chargebacks. I mean, if you get a chargeback because the client was overweight or they have diabetes that they didn't know about, or, you know, God forbid, and they, you know, this happened to, to um, one of the SMDs that used to be in the business. They got a policy for his dad, and they found out he had testicular cancer through doing the blood work for the life insurance, right? But it was like super early stage, they removed it and he's fine. I mean, think about that. Talk about adding some belief into the business, right? But, but figuring out why it happened in the first place. So if you had a person that charged back, it's like a, a client is definitely a lot easier for us to figure out than a person that said they were gonna be here and didn't show up, yeah, yeah. right? Because you're spending 45 minutes to an hour and some of you people that take it even longer than that, three hours with the client, Right? You're getting to really know these people, and you should know whether or not they're going to keep the policy or not. Yeah. Right? I mean, I've gotten a lot better at this. I mean, I, I've, we've gone through our fair shares of trials and tribulations. Right? There was a time, it was a time uh, in this hierarchy where we had a 40% persistency as a hierarchy, right? Because we didn't know who to sell, to sell to and what to sell. I mean, it was just, it was terrible. Right? And then Eric learned his craft, got super amazing at it, and taught the rest of us. And now as, as a hierarchy, our persistency is pretty good because we know what causes a chargeback. Right? Do what, what is causing your recruit to quit? Right? I'm not talking about the people that are here the, for the first you know, t t uh, day, and then they go home and they quit. Right? Or the sign-in dies. They come to the BPM, they get code number, and then they quit. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the people that are here six months. Right? Why are they here for six months? They saw enough value to be here for six months. Why did they decide to leave at that point? Because you already handled the, it's a pyramid. It's one of those things. It doesn't work. You've already handled those things six months in. Okay? Why are they still leaving you at that point? Okay? So if you don't understand the root of the problem, it's going to continue to happen and happen and happen and happen and happen and happen. So find out what caused the adversity. And you can put yourself in a very good position so that it might almost never happen to you again. People are going to quit. We don't know why. People are going to charge back. We don't know why. And that's, that should be like 5% of the time, not 95% of the time. You guys got it? Yes. All right, so the guests are out. We'll say we'll break for about 10, 15 minutes. We'll be right back here for meeting after the meeting. You guys are champions. <laughs> In the night time. Ooh, trap, nigga. Why? Why is he here? <laughs> but he, he did go out in the field with me. I will mention this story. So I think I already told this story the previous week, but somebody that was in the business before, it was actually part of this office, was the one who referred me to these two KTPs that we sat down on on Sunday. And so you know what? I'm so glad that I stuck around and we stuck around, so we're here to service these individuals. Because prior to that, a few days ago, let me just tell you this, this is crazy. So there is this guy that I prospected a while back, Sharp. And I think it was one of um, Eric's directs that reminded me of him. So I messaged him and said, hey, how have you been? Haven't talked to you in a while. And he said, you know what? I'm so sorry to tell you, I only have one month left to live. And I was like, wait, what are you talking about? And I wasn't sure if he was just messing around. He kind of has that personality, and he's always positive. And I haven't actually met him again after I prospected him. And then so I was like, oh, what's wrong? Like, what's going on? And he told me, but he was still very positive. And unfortunately, we weren't able to put anything in place for him. But he said nobody could tell him. No doctors can figure out what's going on with him. 
So then I think after that, I already had such a sense of urgency. So whoever that was sent my way, I called right away. I made sure I set up the KTP right away. And because of that, I got to set up so many on my chicken list. And then so today I checked in with him again. I said, hey, did you get to go to Mayo Clinic? I know that was the last time we spoke. And then he said, unfortunately, there's nothing I can do. I have no energy to do and not, no money left. And I only have two weeks left. And so it just like gives me chills even talking about it because this is someone that I personally met. And at first I wasn't even sure if he's serious or not because it's, it doesn't feel real. But you guys, the sense of urgency, you guys have to have it because what we do is so powerful. There's nothing I can do because I can't save his life per se, but then I could have protected him and made sure that his family's taken care of. And now I just felt like I should have had more sense of urgency when I spoke to him before. So you guys really take that and then go out there and really help families. That's what we do. So it's crazy that, you know, five's not a lot. We have to go and really help more people. But I at least wanted to share this with you guys. Yes. That's